Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland today on this very warm September 9th for our very first Friday Forum of the fall season. I'm Melody Rose, and I'm your City Club President, and I'm very pleased to have all of you with us here today. Both the members and guests who are able to join us here in the room at the Governor Hotel, and of course those of you who are listening on OPB or KBPS radio, and those of you watching on Portland Community City Net 30. Today we are delighted to welcome State Treasurer Ted Wheeler, who will offer an inside look at Oregon's finances. But before our program begins, we have a few announcements. To begin, out of respect to our guests and speaker, please silence your cell phones. Next, I'd like to give a warm City Club welcome to our new City Club members. I know that John Hirsch of Guide Consulting is in the room. John, would you stand so we can welcome you? City Club's corporate and media partners are essential to the vitality and the sustainability of all of the club's activities, including Friday Forum, research reports, and our many other activities. I'd like to thank our generous media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and to offer our deep appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. We are very pleased to welcome three new sponsors for the fall quarter. Please join me in thanking AARP and PGE. Also, Ed Harnden is here with us today from the new fall sponsor, Baron Liebman. Thank you for being here, Ed. Where are you? We're grateful for your support and the support of all of our sponsors, which sustain the City Club mission. And of course, for the rest of you in the room, if your company or firm would like to support the club's mission through corporate sponsorship, please do contact our friendly City Club staff at the back of the room who are always happy to facilitate your gift. In addition to our sponsors, we have some other key supporters with us today, and I'd like to welcome Pat McCormick, City Club President-elect, to the podium in order to recognize them and to make another important announcement. Pat. Thank you very much, Melody. And the people that I want to recognize today are essential to the success and health of the City Club. Uh, many of you know that uh, in kicking off the fall season, we also kick off the annual fund drive. In addition to the dues that we pay as members of the club, which provide around 40% of what we need to support the operations of the club, much of the essential uh, support for the club to keep it operating comes from members of the club who are extra committed to the organization and provide additional support to us through the annual fund. At the top end of those who have been making such commitments to the club is a group we call a leadership circle, those who have committed to the annual fund more than $1,000 per year. And at the tables up in front here, I would ask that the members who have been part of that leadership circle would stand up to be recognized, and um, our gratitude on behalf of the club can be fully expressed to you. So Leadership Circle members, if you would join. <laughs> Thank you all very much for what you have done for the club. As we begin the annual fund drive this year, I want to invite you all, as you will receive in the mail your invitation to participate, and you may well be called by members of the City Club to further invite you to participate in the annual fund. Think about how you can help, because more than one in four dollars that we use to operate the club comes from the contributions of individual members like you. Those of you who have the capability to join these members of the Leadership Circle, we invite you to do that as well. The health and success of our club in being the convener of the conversations that matter in this community, of being a forum where civil discussion about important community issues can be expressed in ways that help illuminate and move the community forward, these are the kinds of things that happen because the, community cl the City Club exists as a community resource. So please, as you get your invitation, 
consider how you can help ensure the longevity of the club as we approach our 100th anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. And thank you for your leadership in this area. Following today's speech, we'll be welcoming City Club members to the microphone for a question and answer period with our speaker. In addition, we invite all of our audience members to write questions for the speaker on the index cards that are on your tables. During the board host question, City Club staff will collect these cards and send questions up here to me, which I'll read from the microphone. We're sure you'll come up with some good questions today. And now to our program. The Oregon State Treasury plays a critical role in securing and enhancing the financial health of the state and all of its residents. Treasury decisions impact income for schools and public institutions, retirement benefits for public employees, college savings accounts for families, and loans for small businesses. With the economic downturn in 2008 and the more recent volatility in the stock market, proper management of state funds is all the more crucial. Today, State Treasurer Ted Wheeler will identify key financial challenges that exist for the state and outline a new economic investment plan to be presented to the 2012 legislature. A longtime Portlander and Lincoln High School grad, go cards, Ted earned a BA in economics from Stanford University. He then traveled east to the Ivy League, securing an MBA from the Columbia University and a master's in public policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. After graduating, Ted served as a lecturer in political science at Northeastern University, and in 1993 published a book read by many of us in this room entitled Government That Works, Innovation in State and Local Government. He worked for several financial services firms before taking office as Multnomah County Chair in 2007. In March 2010, Governor Ted Kulongoski appointed him as state treasurer. He was elected to a full term as treasurer in November of last year. And now, please help me welcome today's speaker, State Treasurer Ted Wheeler. Well, Melody, thank you very kindly for that gracious introduction. Uh, I always like hearing the introductions because they remind me that I used to be a very interesting person. <laughs> you know, that got bigger laughs in my notes. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today. Uh, I always love speaking in front of the Portland City Club. Uh, and by the way, that goes for the city clubs in Salem and Eugene as well. Uh, I find it energizing and frankly, a lot of fun to talk to people who are very dedicated to the community and supportive of the commons and are interested in carrying on a dialogue about how to best serve our communities and our state. So I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be here. And on a more personal note, I wanna let you know how much I appreciate the solid research that gets done here at the City Club of Portland. In my prior capacity as the Multnomah County Chair, and currently in my capacity as the treasurer for the state of Oregon, I've had the opportunity to participate in a number of studies, everything from transportation to public safety, the mental health system, and most recently, the public employee retirement system. And I want you to know uh, that for me, I read those studies and I take them to heart and they help inform my policy decisions. So I'm very appreciative of that. Before I jump in to my remarks today, uh, I want to recognize a couple of very important people that are here in the audience. First and foremost, I want to thank my mother, Leslie Wheeler, and my beautiful wife, <laughs> Katrina Wheeler, for being here today. Uh, I don't know what it means that they're both sitting with their back to the podium. Uh, but at least one thing I can say with certainty, they don't realize that that means they're on TV eating their lunch. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize some other VIPs in the room. Superintendent Carol Smith from the Portland Public Schools is here. <laughs> We're blessed to have two Multnomah County Commissioners, Diane McKeel and Judy Shiprack with us here today. 
The mayor of the great city of Beaverton, Denny Doyle, is sitting towards the back of the room. And a couple of key elected uh, uh, representative, Greg McPherson, is here somewhere. Uh, he is a former state representative and served the state very ably. And David Wind uh, from the Portland School Committee, uh, elected school member, uh, is here as well. And Bobby Regan, do I see Bobby hiding over there? And Trudy Sargent hiding over there? And whoever else I've forgotten? And who? And Pam Knowles is here. I'm sorry, I saw Pam earlier uh, before the presentation is here today. So thank you, distinguished electeds and former electeds, for being here today. So what I want to talk about today is the financial condition of the state of Oregon, but I want to do it in a slightly different way. There's two broad subjects that I really want to address in full. The first of the qu is the question of the state's economic development, our jobs, and our economy. The second broad area that I'd like to discuss is the economic health of the state of Oregon. And I'll discuss both of those in turn. I'll obviously leave plenty of time for question and answers. Of course, provided that you agree not to ask me anything about bridges. <laughs> Before I jump into those subject areas, though, I think it is helpful to have a brief discussion about what the Treasury does in my role as state treasurer. Let's see a show of hands. Who in this room has a good understanding of what the state treasury does? Now, I want you to know as you look at the smattering of hands in this audience that this is probably one of the most informed public policy groups in the state of Oregon. Usually nobody raises their hands. And that's okay, uh, but I will say this. I believe the Oregon treasury is one of the most important state institutions that people know nothing or next to nothing about. And today, I hope I can shed a little bit of light on that. Don't be embarrassed that you don't know anything about it. When I was appointed by former Governor Kulangoski, uh, he asked me in advance, would, would you be interested in being state treasurer? And I had a great deal of respect for Governor Kulangoski and his leadership, and I certainly had a tremendous amount of respect for the late treasurer, Ben Westlin. So there was never really any question that I would accept the job. But I had to push the governor back just a little bit because I needed to leave myself time to get to my computer and Google Oregon State Treasury. <laughs> now, I was delighted with what I found. I found that the state treasury, and I want you to listen aggressively, does not collect taxes. <laughs> That's the Department of Revenue. Additionally, while the treasury is responsible for investing the Oregon Public Employee Retirement Assets, the investments in the pension plan, the PERS board, which is a completely separate entity that the Treasury has nothing to do with, is responsible for the structure and the terms of the state pension plan. I'm sure that'll come up in Q&A, and I just want to make that clear in advance. Now, what do we do? State statute's very specific about the role of the state treasury. We invest $75 billion of state assets, that's the pension plan, but it also includes other investment pools like the Common School Fund, which supports public education across the state of Oregon. It includes the Higher Education Endowment Fund. It includes the State Accident Insurance Fund and other investments as well. We're also the state banker. We're responsible for managing all the cash transactions of all state agencies, plus about 1,600 local jurisdictions. We run about $175 billion of transactions every year through our banking services. Between the investments and transactions, we are one of the largest financial institutions in the Pacific Northwest in and of our own right. But beyond that, we have other roles. We issue and manages, manage the state debt, we administer the Oregon College Savings Plan, and we even play a role around regulation of banks that accept public sector deposits. So in truthfulness, as I sit here uh, and look at your faces, uh, this is pretty complex stuff. Uh, a lot of it is technical, a lot of it's archaic. Frankly, it's the kind of thing that makes a lot of people's eyeballs roll back into their heads. I get asked all the time, well, 
Uh, the last time you were at the City Club, you were the Multnomah County Chair. You presided over a dynamic, thriving organization that had a reputation for excellence uh, and accountability. You were responsible for 4,500 employees. You had a $1.2 billion budget. You and your colleagues presided over the state's largest public health safety net, a thriving public safety organization, 60 plus Sun schools, and one of the very best public library systems anywhere in the United States. And you, and they point to me and they say, and you traded that in for discussions about bank collateralization rates, asset allocation, debentures, hedging strategies and the like. Do you regret it? Do I regret it? The honest answer is not one bit. And I want to tell you why. Every dollar that we earn through the Oregon State Treasury and every dollar we save by innovative thinking in the Oregon State Treasury, those dollars go directly into public education. They go directly into public safety. They go directly into safety net services like mental health and public health services. A lot of the work we do is under the radar. You don't read about it, you don't hear about it. And frankly, that's okay. But I want you to know this. We do things all the time that help move those basic services forward. Earlier this year, we restructured some of our debt. They're called certificates of deposit. I won't bore you with the details, but I will tell you this, as a result of that innovative thinking, we freed up $30 million that the legislators can now move towards other programs. $30 million, folks, that's 330 teachers in a given year. It's real money. Additionally, when it comes to economic development, the legislature debated for six months on whether or not Business Oregon, the state's economic development arm, should have an $18 million budget for business development. With the stroke of a pen and innovative thinking coming out of the Treasury, we were able to increase the amount of capital through changing our collateralization rates, there's that word again, by increasing our collateralization rates, we freed up $1 billion that banks can now lend out to communities and businesses that want to grow and expand here in the state of Oregon. And again, you didn't read anything about it. Now, having the Treasury be a fairly unknown entity, you know, that's a double-edged sword. On one hand, uh, it's hard to build a coalition of support for what we do. The truth is this, when we are left to our own devices, when we're allowed to hire the people we need to hire, make the kind of partnerships we need to make, do the kinds of things we need to do to come up with that innovative thinking and get exceptional investment results, when we're left to our own devices, we perform very well for the state of Oregon. But it's hard to build support when people really don't know who we are, that we even exist, frankly. On the flip side, I find it liberating that people don't really know what our narrow statutory mission is. And as a result, we can expand well beyond it. And that's the great opportunity of being your state treasurer. I see opportunities for us to use not only our desire, but our real tools and our experience to help move this state's economy forward. We have tremendous tools in the treasury, and I'll talk about them in a minute. But the key for me is that we have that opportunity not only to help get people back to work and start employing Oregonians again at the end of this recession, we actually have a much bigger view. We have a vision of helping to lay the foundation for a future Oregon economy where we compete on the world stage and we win. Likewise, around the state's fiscal health, I don't think the Treasury should be silent on matters of spending, or on matters of revenue. I think we have a very important voice to bring to the table. And as the chief financial officer for the state, I think it would be foolish for me not to chime in on those issues and use our expertise and analysis to do the right thing. In short, I see the Treasury as being both the crankshaft and the pistons of our state's fiscal engine. And I intend to take what is currently a Ferrari parked in the garage, I'm taking it out for a spin. And we're going to run it hard.
But what you will hear is we are expanding the role of the Treasury. You know what? You're darn right. We are. And that's going to be part of my leadership. It has been part of my leadership, and it will continue to be part of my leadership. Now, a quick review of how we're doing. I mentioned investments. We're doing well. Uh, I don't have the August numbers yet. I can tell you everybody on the face of this planet took a shellacking in August, and I'm less concerned about the short-term performance than I am about the long-term performance. I can tell you year-to-date your pension plan was at 16.5% rates of return. We're blowing the socks off the benchmarks that we compare ourselves again. Over the last seven years, the pension plan has been in the top 3% of pension plans nationally. Not, you know, everything with the pension isn't square and where we'd like it to be, but it's getting better. The PERS board reports that the pension plan is now 88% funded. I use a different statistic. I look at the funding net of side accounts. You don't need to know what that is, but it's 79%. So we're starting to build our portfolio back up, and it's largely as a result of outstanding investment returns. The college savings fund, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, the, um, um, the higher education endowment fund, the common school fund, are also doing well. The common school fund has actually come very close to doubling in value over the last two years. The Oregon College Savings Plan, for the first time ever, has $1.1 billion in assets, so we're very happy about that. The state's also been very frugal with its debt management. This is a key component of our state's fiscal health. Where other states were going hog wild during this last legislative session to issue debt in order to cover their short-term budget shortfalls, I made a recommendation to the legislature a year ago that we hold the line on the issuance of new general fund supported debt. I was the first treasurer in the United States to make that call. And much to the credit of the legislature, their leadership, and our governor, the state of Oregon did hold the line on the issuance of new debt. Combining that fiscal discipline around debt with our outstanding investment returns earned the state of Oregon a very rare upgrade in our credit rating by Standard & Poor's. Most other states did not experience that. They either stayed the same or they had downgrades. Notably, the government of the United States of America experienced a credit downgrade. Oregon, even in this tough economic environment, went against the grain and earned a credit rating increase. What? <laughs> now, to put some perspective on that, uh, the importance of a credit rating increase is that when we invest in things, when we build school facilities, research facilities, social service facilities, roads or bridges or anything else, the cost to taxpayers of those projects is dependent upon the credit rating that we earn. The bottom line, the better the credit rating, the lower the cost, the more our dollars can invest in. We can do better with a higher credit rating, so I'm proud of that. I want to shift to the question of jobs. It's related to our state's fiscal health. Historically, the treasurer has not played a significant role in jobs. I think that's been a lost opportunity. The treasury, after all, has many tools, direct investment in businesses, our debt capacity, the power of our pension plan. We have many tools that could be used to help further our economic goals. But historically, the Treasury has shied away from an economic development imperative. I may be different in that regard as your state treasurer. I believe we should be on the leading edge of leading the economic development charge. In part, I think that comes from my background. I came from the private sector. I've owned and operated businesses. I've stood behind the cash register. I've met payroll. I've paid the business income taxes. And I've had successes. And yes, I've had object failures. But what all of that experience has taught me is I know how to create jobs, and I know when I'm looking at the tools of the Treasury, I'm looking at a toolkit of very powerful tools to help move our economy forward. And I want to talk about that. First, I want to talk about my relationship with the governor. I want to give him credit where credit is due. 
Historically, Governor Kitzhaber as the governor is the leader of our economic development function in the state of Oregon. He's given me as treasurer and the treasury a wide degree of latitude around economic development. He's allowed us to dig into our current infrastructure and our current strategies and recommend changes that he's going to then help lead through the legislative process. He allowed me to help lead his economic development transition when he was coming into office, and I'm very appreciative of that. He asked me, and he asked my team, which included State Representative Tobias Reed, local attorney Wally Van Valkenburg, uh, Scott Nelson from the governor's office, Tim McCabe from Business Oregon, and others. He asked us to look at the gaps that exist around business development in the state of Oregon with special focus on capital available for businesses. What we found was fairly astounding, or at least to me it was astounding. We found that there were substantial economic development resources available in the state of Oregon, but they weren't deployed very thoughtfully. There were resources scattered across different agency. They were fragmented. You could find economic development resources in the Treasury, in Business Oregon, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, and elsewhere. But they weren't in any way unified or coordinated. They weren't under any sort of a strategic framework. There was no sense of prioritization in terms of what investments would maximize our return in terms of economic activity or job creation. Instead, it was just sort of a mishmash and it was up to businesses, either businesses that wanted to locate here or businesses that wanted to expand in the state of Oregon. The burden was on them to track down those resources. I met with a business leader who called four different agencies trying to figure out what sort of incentives or loan programs or grants might be available to him and to his enterprise because he wanted to expand it. Isn't that the kind of thing we're looking for now in the state of Oregon? And you know where he ended up? In a mailbox, a voice mailbox, to which apparently nobody is attached. He never got a return call. That is a lost opportunity. The governor took that information and he used it to great effect. He created a one-stop shop under Business Oregon and started the process of consolidating these resources and putting them under a strategic plan, which I think is fantastic. He's showing good, strong leadership in this arena. But we wanted to keep going even beyond the transition. We asked the governor if we could continue to look at a more dramatic, a bolder plan around business capitalization. The governor and his team gave us the green light. They gave us the support and the staffing to continue our work we brought in a couple of additional partners. Amongst those partners were Alan Alley. Uh, and I'll just say somewhat humorously, he's brought on because of his experience with Pixelworks. He's very passionate about this, and I hope to keep him extremely engaged on this project so he has no time for any extracurricular activities, <laughs> at least until 2014. Now, these folks see what I see, which is Oregon has a tremendous amount of potential. We're located on the Pacific Rim. We have a highly educated workforce. We have relatively low energy costs. Although we could quibble around the edges uh, about our tax structure on the whole, we have a very favorable corporate tax structure. We have natural assets to our advantage, like pure water. People don't think about purity of water unless, of course, you're Intel and you're in the chip making business or your solar world and uh, you're responsible uh, for making wafers. Water quality matters. So there are opportunities we have, but they're not competitive advantages. These things don't become competitive advantages unless you cultivate them and invest in them. Let me give you a specific example. It's great that we're on the Pacific Rim, but from a trading perspective, if we don't have the right policies and outreach to trading partners in the Pacific Rim, and we don't invest in our port facilities to make them modern and efficient, then it doesn't really matter that we're on the Pacific Rim other than that it gives a rock and coastline, which we all appreciate. So we looked at these gaps and we tried to find uh, a plan that made sense. We started looking at what other states are doing. I mentioned to you, for example, 
uh, that the legislature spent six months looking at the economic development dollars for business Oregon, $18 million. Compare that to Ohio with a billion dollar commitment, or Michigan with a $300 million commitment, or other states like California or Utah or Colorado that have all engaged in significant economic development activities in recent years. We need to do more because if we take a bolder approach, we can leverage more job growth and economic activity in our state. So today I want to introduce you to the outline of a bold new plan for the state of Oregon. I'm speaking today with the governor's permission and with my colleague's permission to get the dialogue going. We don't have all the details worked out. We're loosely calling it the Oregon Investment Act and no, I did not consult with the President of the United States beforehand about what we should call our respective plans. The Oregon Investment Act is going to be a major economic development play for the state of Oregon. It's going to be a significant commitment to our future economic growth. Basically, it will work like this. We will create a fund, a new fund, the Oregon Growth Fund, that will be used to leverage out-of-state dollars into Oregon employers and into the Oregon economy. We'll work hard to grow our nascent venture capital uh, infrastructure in the state of Oregon. We're going to completely reform, uh, overhaul, and increase the amount of loans that are available to businesses in the state of Oregon through our loan participation programs. We're going to do everything we can to support mentorship, particularly around early stage investment in companies and high technology innovation. We're gonna support mentorship and we're gonna support what's called technology transfer, where you take research and you move it to the commercialization phase and then you grow companies that employ Oregonians at high wages right here in the state of Oregon instead of having that great research commercialization opportunity stripped away by other states and other nations that are in a better position to be able to fund those opportunities. You're probably asking, well, how are you gonna fund this? It'll be funded predominantly through lottery sources, lottery dollar sources, which are specifically set aside for economic development activities, but we're looking at other sources as well. So we're walking it around the state, we're talking to business leaders, we're talking to chambers of commerce, we're talking to the business associations, community leaders and community groups, just like this, to begin the process of rolling it out to the public. We're gonna earn support for it in the February 2012 legislative session. If this passes, it will demonstrate a major commitment on the part of the state of Oregon to capitalizing businesses and growing our economy. There's one other quick detail I want to add. I get asked all the time by institutions, by community foundations, even by individuals, is there any way that I can invest in Oregon's economy directly as an investor? There will be an answer in this package. We're calling it the Oregon Growth Mutual Fund. It will allow institutions and individuals to invest in Oregon's economy in a taxed advantaged way. Much like today you could invest in the Oregon College Savings Plan in a tax advantaged manner. We're going to create a vehicle like that as part of this package that will allow people to deploy resources from Oregon into Oregon's economy. I look forward to taking your questions on this and obviously uh, as this strategy unfolds in the coming months uh, we'll all have much more to say about it. Related to business capitalization is the sort of thorny question of infrastructure. And I'll be a little more brief on this one because I think it's a little more straightforward and you'll get my point fairly quickly. If you want your economy to thrive in the long term, you need to invest in certain kinds of infrastructure. In the state of Oregon, the best tool we currently have to do that is the, is the debt the bonds that are issued by the Oregon State Treasury and other local governments. You would think in the state of Oregon, since that is very precious resource and it's what you invest to grow your economy over the long run, that we'd have a very comprehensive and specific plan on how to deploy those debt assets. 
but if you thought that as i did prior to taking the job as state treasurer you would be wrong no such plan exists in fact oregon does something different when it comes to the issuance of debt what we do is every biennium the treasurer convenes a committee figures out what debt capacity exists gives the legislature that number and then the legislature hammers it out how they want to use that capacity and I don't mean to oversimplify it but we all know how a legislative process works whoever has the most political clout or the best lobbyist wins that's how it works in the state of Oregon we don't have a multi-year strategy or a multi-year plan there's no lens through which we evaluate debt to determine whether certain investments give us a higher rate of return in terms of generating economic activity and job growth over other investments if you were an economic anthropologist and I'm not sure any such line of study exists. It probably should, because I think personally it would be interesting. Of course, I think debentures are interesting, so what do I know? <laughs> but if you were an economic anthropologist and you were going back and looking at how Oregon used its precious bonding capacity in years past, and you tried to infer from that, what was Oregon's economic development strategy? What were they investing in for the long term? You know what you'd find? You'd find that we were putting a lot of our eggs in the prison building basket. Prisons. Really. Now, folks, I am not soft on crime. People who know me know that. But I am soft on stupid. We do need to prioritize the use of that debt. We're a traded sector economy. That means we make stuff and we ship it elsewhere and we get the added value and that goes into our family's pockets. It helps us to become economically self-sufficient. We use it to grow our businesses. It's what creates tax base to support all those programs I care about, like mental health services and disability services and schools and public safety. That's what we would be investing in uh, if we were as concerned as I think we should be. We'd be investing in infrastructure like freight mobility, roads, bridges, airports, seaports. Is there anybody here from Eastern Oregon today? Anybody from Eastern Oregon? One person, really? Thank you. <laughs> I love Eastern Oregon, so thank you for being here, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, this gentleman would probably tell you how important rail spurs are to the Eastern Oregon agricultural economy. If you're moving wheat to a port, you're competing in a commoditized market, in a worldwide market where the cost per bushel, every quarter of a cent counts. And rail spurs are what help keep that product competitive, in addition to investing in our freight and our port facilities. I hear a lot of talk about the industries of the future for the state of Oregon. I hear a lot of talk about renewable energy, transportation strategies, high technology, all these great ideas and prospects for the state of Oregon. But if you really believe that that's where the future of our state lies economically, then shouldn't we be supporting higher education? Shouldn't we be investing in research and development capacity? Shouldn't we be investing and technology transfer and all these things that move innovation and research to commercialization and help make us competitive on all of those product fronts. That's where our resources should be deployed. I am proposing that we create either a debt authority for the state of Oregon that focuses specifically on the debt stream or we broaden it to include some of the work that's currently going on around the creation of an infrastructure bank in the state of Oregon. An infrastructure bank being a process whereby we consolidate and coordinate infrastructural investment dollars into some sort of a strategic plan with follow-on. In the Treasury, we're actually looking at creating an alliance with other states on the West Coast. Imagine if we brought our resources together and created a West Coast infrastructure bank. 
Denny Doyle in Beaverton is part of a very exciting project going on here in the state of Oregon, where we're looking at the creation of an Oregon-based infrastructure bank. Whatever form this takes, it's imperative that the state of Oregon, in addition to closing our gaps around business capitalization, it's imperative that we also have a strategy and resources consolidated for the purpose of investing in economic development infrastructure in the state of Oregon. Now, here's where it gets really exciting. Related to closing the gaps around capital and the gaps around investment and in infrastructure is the question of workforce development. The best workforce development we have in the state of Oregon are our colleges, our community colleges, our universities, and our post-secondary technology training centers. They're terribly important because we know that by the year 2018, two-thirds of the jobs in the United States of America will require people to have at least a college degree to be able to get those jobs. We're moving into a technology and information economy, and that college degree or that post-secondary training is going to be critical. Two-thirds of the jobs will require it. Today, only a few years before 2018, less than half of Americans meet that threshold. That's true also in the state of Oregon. So we know that these degrees and this training is going to be more important than ever than ever at exactly the time that it's getting harder and harder for families in the state of Oregon to be able to afford a college education. This will shock you. The cost of a college education is going up at three times the rate of health care costs. The class of 2011 graduated as the most indebted class in the history of the United States. For the first time ever last year, student loans surpassed credit card debt as the major component of personal debt. I had the opportunity last year to go out to lunch with a group of students from the University of Oregon. I don't know what lottery they lost that they had to spend their lunch time with me, but I think the way it happened was a dean had, a, had, had purchased something at an auction where I'd agreed to take people out to lunch. So the dean invited her young students. They were all juniors and seniors at the University of Oregon. I found out through talking to them that four out of five of those students had either chosen their degree or changed their degree, taking into account their ability to pay off their student loans. That's a shame. That's a shame. The time for leadership in the state of Oregon is now in terms of addressing the question of college affordability. In the Treasury, we've been doing our part. I told you we're responsible for administering the Oregon College Savings Plan. Because of the solid investments, because of the record number of families and individual accounts that are coming into that system, we were actually able to cut in half the fees that the state charges to participants in the Oregon College Savings Plan. And I'm very proud of that fact. It's made what's already a very affordable college savings vehicle even more affordable for Oregonians. But it doesn't reach enough people. No, we need something much bigger and we need something much bolder. What I'm proposing is that we use a significant portion of the state's debt capacity beginning in 2014 to overhaul and enhance the Oregon Opportunity Grant Program. The way it would work is this. If a university wants to participate in our grant program, they could do so on a matching basis with the state of Oregon. If I'm a student in a family and I want to participate in a college education or a post-secondary technical training program, I could apply to the program. Assuming I meet the qualifications, I would get half of the deduction from the state of Oregon through the endowment we would create, and I would get half from the university through their 50% contribution. The $250 million that I'm proposing for this program would therefore be leveraged by an additional $250 million that would be provided by private sector fundraising, by the universities and their affiliates. This is the kind of bold thinking that the state of Oregon is going to need to engage in if we are truly serious 
about making college affordable for all Oregon families and making post-secondary training available to Oregonians in order to close the gaps. Between these three ideas, the Oregon College Affordability Act, which I think addresses the workforce problem or a significant portion of it, the Oregon Investment Act, which closes the gaps around funding of small and existing businesses in the state of Oregon, and the creation of an infrastructure bank or debt authority, which would help us smartly deploy our debt and capital planning for the future. Those three things would make a very strong statement to the rest of the world that Oregon is open for business and we are serious about caring for our citizens and the future of our economy. Now, I want to shift to a slightly different subject but related, and that's the economic health of this state. And I won't go on for quite as long, but there's a few points I want to touch on here. I already said that three important aspects of our state's financial health are investments, which are doing well, our debt management, I think we're being fiscally disciplined and smart and responsible for it. Our credit rating, which obviously was just increased, which I'm very happy about. But there's other things that we need to address that I'm less happy about and less satisfied with in terms of our results. I have said on this stage before that Oregon has a dysfunctional revenue structure. It's still dysfunctional. There's lots of problems with it, but one of the core problems, the underlying problem, is the volatility of our revenue structure. Did you know that 90% of our state's general fund dollars come from the income tax? We're the most dependent state in the United States on the income tax. The problem with that is income taxes go like this. In good years, they go way up in terms of total collected revenue. In bad years, they go way down because nobody's earning any money. So we have this problem of boom or bust. It's hard to plan. It's hard to strategize. It's frustrating for people like the Multnomah County commissioners who work so hard to build a mental health system and then because of a bad year or two have to eviscerate the entire thing because of the volatility in our revenue structure. But it's worse than that. We have created a revenue structure in the state of Oregon that no other state has come anywhere close to replicating because they want nothing to do with it. If you're going to have volatility, if you're going to have volatility, wouldn't you at least want to capture the upside? You're taking the risk of volatility, so the reason you do that, right, is so you can capture the upside in the good years. Well, we don't even do that. We give it back. That's like going to your stockbroker and saying, I want the riskiest investment you can put me in, and if we have a gangbuster year, you just keep the rest. <laughs> that doesn't make sense from an economic perspective, and it's no way to run a railroad. We give it back in the form of the kicker. It is a constitutionally mandated anti-savings mechanism that we have built into our revenue structure. I understand it's popular. Who doesn't like receiving checks in the mail? I like receiving checks in the mail. Feel free to. <laughs> it's my only political statement today. I won't make any more, I promise. But there's a trade-off. I had a conversation with a lady in Klamath Falls. She was telling me, I'd made this speech or something about it on the kicker, and I said the governor and I went to the legislature and we said, reform the kicker. And she said, well, you're wrong, Treasurer Wheeler. And the governor was wrong. And the reason you're wrong is because I like getting my check. Two minutes later in the conversation, she was complaining about the class size in her kid's public school. She wasn't connecting that giving back revenue and having the class size in public schools fluctuate, they're related. We need to reform the kicker. Measure 50. Measure 50 needs to be reformed. It's choking the life out of local governments that are dependent upon property taxes. The cost of government, particularly health care, public safety, and employee costs goes up much faster than the revenue that comes in when you cap the growth of property taxes through Measure 50. It's choking the life out of Coos County right now. And when they lose their timber payments, Coos County is going to find itself in a world of hurt. They're projecting themselves effective bankruptcy in 2014. 
I have said year after year that the first governments in this state to go under will not be Multnomah County or the city of Portland. It will be our rural communities where they have precious other resource opportunities available to them. We need to address Measure 50. We need a rainy day fund in the state of Oregon. I put forward a proposal with Senator Chris Eldwards to create a funding mechanism for the rainy day fund. It would capture the interest on the general fund and put it into a rainy day fund. It was great. It wouldn't have taken any money out of any existing program and it wouldn't have raised taxes for anybody. It would just be exercising fiscal discipline. I'm going to bring it back because we need to have a robust means of funding a rainy day fund. I will stop there. I will tell you this, because you are the most informed citizens in the great state of Oregon. I'm counting on you more to help move these proposals through. I hope I have been provocative and have offered up bold strategies around revenue reform, around business capitalization, around infrastructure investment, around college affordability and workforce development to inspire you, to help me move these things through the legislature. They have to go to the legislature. Some have to be voted on by the public at large. There is nothing less than the economic future of this state at stake. And I ask you to lead with me. Thank you for having me here today. And I'll take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Wheeler. Clearly, the Ferrari has left the driveway. Before I introduce our Friday Forum host, if you have written a question on an index card at your table, now is the time to hold it up so the City Club staff can collect it and bring it uh, to, the, to the microphone. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, which today is City Club Governor and immediate past president, Sharon Van Sickle Robbins. Sharon now operates a cut flower business with 20,000 peony plants on Sovie Island. She's been a city club member since 1996 and chaired the club's business environment study committee. Sharon. Um, my question is, assuming Congress can pass anything right away, um, what kind of potential impact could the President's American Jobs Act have on Oregon's finances? Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, so, stipulating the if that was built into the front end of your sentence, and I'll, I'll just take it on good faith, uh, that the bipartisan spirit we saw yesterday was genuine and that there is a bipartisan agreement that Congress needs to act uh, it could have a significant impact on the state of Oregon. Uh, some of the key components which I was most attracted to, number one, continuing to support education. That's good in the short run because so many jobs depend on education. Keep in mind, in the state of Oregon, 50% of towns in our state, the largest employer is the public school, the public school system. Uh, so number one, it would protect jobs, and number two, uh, as I hope I've made the case, one of the best investments that we can make in our own economy and our future is in education. So I'm particularly attracted to that piece. The president extended a program that currently exists around retaining and hiring people who are unemployed. It's a tax credit. It was through the employee tax uh, program. Uh, I think that's a good strategy. It would obviously impact all employees in the state of Oregon who pay payroll taxes. That certainly is a good thing that could help. Uh, the best part about it was the commitment to investing in infrastructure. Uh, and if I could wave a magic wand, uh, there are two projects that would have access, actually I'll add a third, three projects that would have access to those infrastructural developments. Number one, the Selwood Bridge. <laughs> Number two, the Columbia River Crossing when there is a regional agreement on what that project will look like. And number three, the city of Portland and Multnomah County need a new downtown courthouse. Uh, and we've tried 
six ways to Sunday to find a solution for that. I know Commissioners McKeel and Shiprack have been very engaged in that. Uh, without some sort of outside help, it's not going to happen. But those of you who are attorneys in this room understand the legal infrastructure in this community is a huge component of our economy. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to continue to hold that component together. So I, I think it could have a significant impact. Uh, the question is, what does it look like when it gets through Congress? And that's anybody's guess today. Uh, after all, we're, we're now officially into the campaign season. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. We'll now take questions from the floor. As always, members are invited to the microphone to ask their questions. Asking questions at Friday Forum is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark, that means it's time to wrap it up and get to the question. Also, we'll be sure to read at least one audience member question today from the tables. <clears throat> Kurt Wavering, member. Uh, you said very clearly that uh, we have a dysfunctional revenue uh, system. Um, you carefully avoided uh, mentioning other possibilities. So my question is, uh, what are those possibilities? Does it include um, uh, perhaps a sales tax, value-added tax, legalizing marijuana, uh, other sin taxes? Uh, what should we look at? And what, well, I have a, the other question would be by what standards, but uh, that's kind of a lo lengthy discussion. The discussion should be all options on the table. Let me start with the easy ones and work my way to the hard ones. First of all, I don't support legalizing marijuana. Uh, I read the research carefully, uh, and I am just of the opinion that we would create as many problems as we would solve. I believe there are other strategies for raising revenue without the same amount of headaches. Let's start with the easy ones. There are now uh, 350 tax exemptions in state government and local government. Uh, those exemptions mean that we are only collecting 46 cents on every dollar levied in the state of Oregon at the state and local level. I am not confident that those exemptions are in fact generating the outcomes that we think they are. And I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, when I was the county chair, I asked for an analysis of the multi-family low-income housing tax credit. And I was very disappointed to find that wealthy real estate developers, including one living in Palm Springs, were using that tax exemption for the purpose of building market rate housing. So the taxpayers were in fact subsidizing some guy's real estate dream here in the state of Oregon. And there was no accountability to the program. Nobody was really watching the shop. Uh, and I'm glad that I had a chance to work with my colleagues and Commissioner Nick Fick and Fish at City Hall to help close that gap. But the first thing we should do is look at what sort of exemptions and credits we're offering up and ask ourselves, are we truly doing what we think we're doing with those exemptions? Uh, number two, I mentioned Measure 50. Uh, I have gone to the legislature multiple times and I've argued either for the outright elimination of Measure 50 or a significant reform of Measure 50. When you limit property tax assessed growth to 3% per year, you're choking off the life of government's ability to pay for services, not that we as government people want, but services you say you want and expect government to deliver, like basic public safety and schools. Uh, I would broaden the tax base. I think having 90% of our state's general fund come from the income tax uh, is too narrow, it's too volatile. Uh, I am open to discussions about VATs. I'm open to discussions about a sales tax. I'm philosophically not opposed to any of those things. And oh, by the way, uh, has anybody here ever been to Seattle? Anybody? You ever been to San Francisco? Ever been to New York? Boston? Just about anywhere else in the world? Did it ever occur to you as you're getting on the plane, oh my God, I forgot I'm going to a sales tax city I better get off. <laughs> the question is fairness, breadth, stability, adequacy. Those are the values that I would look at. I don't really care what sort of system we create to do it, but the system we have in place today doesn't meet any of those core values. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, sorry, I forgot. Okay. Um, we have time for one quick response here from uh, an index card question. As the chair of the Multnomah County Commission, you were noted to have concerns about tax increment finance. I hope you know what that means, because I don't. What are your thoughts about limiting its use to real, quote unquote, economic development? <laughs> yes. Um, tax increment financing is part of the old urban renewal discussion. Urban renewal areas are created in areas that are blighted. You then cap the taxes in those areas. You make significant investments in those areas. And the theory is you create jobs and economic activity. The tax base in that area grows. Um, and then that growth of tax goes back into the urban renewal area for additional investments for some period of time, at the end of which the urban renewal area is discontinued. The problem I have with urban renewal uh, is that it doesn't often do what we think it's doing. It should be used for blighted areas. It's a great investment opportunity to help improve a community, and it's a powerful tool. But it can easily get ca be captured and misused by people who would use it to cap an area that's already showing rapid growth, and then using it simply to subsidize private sector real estate development. I'm opposed to that. I also believe the public needs to be better informed about how urban renewal areas are performing. It's bothersome to me that these things seem to get created in this community and then they never go away. They just get extended and extended and extended. Now as county chair, the problem I had with it was that's tax base that could be going to county services like mental health services or public safety or anti-poverty services or aging services, but instead it was being used for what my mind saw as sometimes pet projects. You know, people have gone down to the legislature and argued that surface parking lots are by definition blighted. And so people who own surface parking lots are now entitled to urban renewal dollars to help develop stuff on these so-called blighted parking lots. I don't think that's right. And so I would call on all of us who have an interest in municipal finance or county finance in particular to take a look at how we are using that urban renewal tool and make sure we're really using it in blighted areas and we're really using it on projects that generate job growth and tax base and that we are discontinuing the urban renewal area when the job is accomplished. Thank you. Well, we've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for today. Leadership Circle members, you can find the post-forum event in the second floor fireside room. Please join us next week with national speaker David Sertner from AARP to learn about the future of Social Security. And as we close, please join me in expressing our deep appreciation to today's speaker, Treasurer Ted Wheeler. Thank you. We are adjourned.